Just what is the impact on America of having a poor relationship with Turkey? How is it more significant than many people realize? How did decades of U.S. globalist policies following the end of the Cold War impact the Middle East? And how do Turkey's different alliances affect America's relationship with Iran? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Jan Yekelik. Today we sit down with Erbil Gunasti, who was UN press officer for eight separate Turkish prime ministers, including the man who is Turkey's current president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Gunasti is the author of the book Game Changer, Trump Card, Turkey and Erdogan. Gunasti embraced America and became a naturalized U.S. citizen. We explore how, in his eyes, the nature of America's relationship with Turkey is critical to a peaceful future for the entire Middle East and the world. Erbil Gunasti, wonderful to have you on American Thought Leaders. Very nice to be here. So Erbil, you were actually the UN press secretary to eight separate prime ministers of Turkey. Press, press officer for eight prime ministers of Turkey, correct. And, uh, and later you became an American mm -hmm. and you've actually run for mayor of Palm Springs, if I recall. Which that's is, 2015. That's right. And uh, right now you have published a remarkable book, Turkey and Erdogan, Game Changer, Trump Card, which is what we're going to talk about today. Who did you write this book for? Well, first I, I wrote it for American audience. When I was running for mayor in Southern California, um, after 30, 40 years in this country, I can't remember anymore, uh, I noticed one thing that Americans don't know much about Middle East. How did I find out about Israel? When they didn't know about Israel, you know, we're talking some of the elected officials. They didn't know anything about Israel other than praising Israel. Uh, but then I said, if they don't know about Israel, how would they know the rest of them? Like the Arabs, per Persians, Turks, and all the other smaller elements. So I said, maybe it is Southern California. They are in a different world. So when I came to Washington, D.C., I noticed the same thing. It is there. And we're talking about the U.S. Congress. We're talking the top people, representatives of the U.S. They don't know as much as they should know. Why? I'm civilian. I'm not an elected official. I know more. I shouldn't know more. They should know. Some of them should know a lot more than I do. So I said, hold on. I'm an American citizen now. I have a job to do. And I'm here because of the Trump revolution, because of Trump presidency, uh, which we are part of as a Republican, as a Trump uh, supporter, delegates. So I said, I have to write something so that I can pass the information instead of verbally, formally, in writing to everybody. So I wrote this one first to American audience. So when you write a book, you explain the country and the leader to audience, to large audience, to all the Americans. But then the next two people were, one of them was Trump, the president himself, because he should know what I'm talking about. Right. And the other one was the US senators and Congress, members of the you know, House, House of Representatives. So they should know so that everybody is on the same playing field. So President Trump is actually on the cover, a little bit off to the side, and of course uh, uh, President Erdogan of Turkey is front and center. And the, the title is Game Changer. Who is the Game Changer? First of all, I thought Game Changer, Turkey and Erdogan are Game Changers. Game Changers for the U.S. But on the other hand, when you look at President Trump, he's a Game Changer in America but he's also a game changer in the world. After all, this is a superpower. The United right. States is a superpower. Right. Whether you, one likes it or not, that's for Trump or for America, United States, it's a game changer. So the, the title works for US. This is, US is a game changer. President Trump is a game changer. Erdogan himself is a game changer. Separate from Turkey, Turkey is a game changer. And all four of them are a game changer. So the book is actually is a game changer for me because I don't have to explain to anybody anymore uh, 
verbally. So, you know, recently we've had these drone strikes in Saudi, you know, big oil refineries hit. Um, Secretary of State Pompeo has said Iran is responsible. Um, what does the mess, what, what does Game Changer have to say about this? Well, Game Changer explains all these uh, elements that we just talked about on the cover, uh, puts it in a perspective. It says, here's a Middle East uh, where Turkey is. Uh, what is Middle East? Middle East is composed of three major groups. What are the major groups? Each one is 100 million people. One of them is Turks. The other one are Persians, Shiites, whatever it's right. called, Iran. however they are called here. And the third are Arabs. Now, each one of these 100 million also have another 100 million, these are general numbers, that they are influencing. For instance, in Persia, in Iran, there is like, like in 70, 80 million people but when you look at it, who do they influence from Yemen to Libya to, uh, sorry, uh, Yemen to Syria to Lebanon to Iraq? It's about 200 million people. When you look at Turks, there's 100 million Turks, but there is also in Central Asia, there are Turks and everywhere else in Europe, and there is, they have more than 150 million of them. And Arabs are over 200 people. Now, you have to have a balance of power in the Middle East. If one of these pillars, three pillars, are not there, then you cannot have it. So you have to balance these three to have a steady Middle East. So what's happening today in Saudi Arabia? Drones. Where do they come from? doesn't matter if they are coming from Iran or somewhere else. But there is a problem between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Why? Well, I put the blame easily, as a Republican, one would say, to Obama. Why not? Well, there is plenty of examples what Obama did not do that brought us to this level. If you give Iran sunset clause that you will become a nuclear power in 8 years, 10 years, 15 years, well, now you have to do something for Saudi Arabia, something for Turkey. Why? Because Iran, nuclear power Iran, is going to eat those two alive if they don't have equivalent. So Turkey asked for Patriots, Patriots defensive missiles, missile system, okay. and Obama refused it. Now, it's Obama's decision to think what's good for America, like President Trump thinks. Today, President Trump defies U.S. senators, Republican senators, and goes and Make, uh, reaches out to Erdogan. Why he does that? Because as an executive power, it is his job to make this overture. He says, that's why he, in Osaka, Japan, he said it's Obama at the end. He didn't say it in Buenos Aires, but he said in Osaka. And he, he came to this conclusion because if you don't give to this country Patriot missiles, and the other one you gave a nuclear, okay, you already caused a problem to this balance of power. Now, what about Saudi Arabia? You didn't do anything about Saudi Arabia because America, United States of America, has to go protect Saudi Arabia. This is what it came down to. Iran said, okay, you play the game. I'm not going to attack Turkey because Turkey has other missiles. So this is, this is quite interesting. Now, of course, a big you know, pillar of U.S. policy for Iran right now is strong sanctions, strong sanctions basically to prevent ultimately the development of the nuclear capability and so forth. Um, clear from what we've seen, Iran, uh, uh, Turkey isn't so interested in these sanctions. What do you make of this? Well, in, in order to apply sanctions to Iran, if you, I mean, any political scientist, when they look at Iran, if you don't have Russia and Turkey on your side, at least one of them, that's for the U.S., for the West, if you don't have Russia or Turkey on your side, you cannot influence Iran. You cannot impose sanctions on Iran. Now, 1980, 
war between Iraq and Iran is a good example. Okay. And I say that's when the U.S. shot itself, itself on the foot by allowing Iraq, Saddam Hussein, to attack Iran. What happened? Stalemate. Nothing happened. With all the might, European might, behind Iraq, uh, the Western powers couldn't deal with Iran. They couldn't invade, nothing happened. The same regime, you know, the regime came to power and stayed. It was the weakest okay. point of that regime. So that's a good example what happened. Now, in 2003, George Bush, he committed suicide by invading Iraq. Why? Because now you don't have Iraq at all. You just took that thing out of the uh, out of equation. Fight. Now. What, what do you have left? You have Turkey and Russia still there. And Obama administration never dealt with Turkey, snubbed Turkey, like Angela Merkel of the other globalists in Europe together, they snubbed Turkey. So what happened? You don't have Turkey. You never had Russia anyway, since Putin came to power after the 1991 disintegration of Soviet Union. And he doesn't, you know, he cares about the Russia proper. So how are you going to influence anything on Iran? You took everything out. That's why President Trump today is left deck of cards by Obama and that are not playable. They are, they are worse, car, worse kind of cards. I see. And then you translate this to Saudi Arabia. In this book, what, is your, what are your thoughts on how the US should engage with Turkey? Well, first of all, you, Turkey has been and is and will continue to be a staunch ally of the United States. Because when you look at Turkish history, where did they come from and where are they going? And they came and they settled in Asia Minor. They became the floodgate and they also became a land bridge for the Western civilization in Europe. So in other words, Turkey is an integral part of Western civilization, whether one likes it or not. And when Turkey is integral part of the Western civilization, that means it's an automatically an ally of the United States. Turkey came there and stays there. So, you know, from what we're seeing, for example, right, Turkey has gone out and, uh, you know, is, for example, working with Russia, buying these, is it the S-400 missile systems from Russia in contravention of, you know, NATO rules and, and so forth. This is, again, something that, that suggests a, a, a different route than you're suggesting, or what would you say? This is all U.S. senators and Obama. And President Trump saw this. As soon as he came in, the first days in his office, in the office, when he looked at, he looked many things. One of the things he saw is F-35 project, trillion dollar project. He says, what is this? This is too expensive. I'm sure, I don't know information, I'm sure he said, can we get rid of this thing and do something else? This is not marketable, workable, full of holes. I mean, okay. as, he's a two, so what did, well, it came out two years later. In two years, what happened is when the U.S. did not sell Patriots, Turkey says, look, you are giving the other side nuclear weapons, whether you are giving it or not, sunset clause or not, all that thing. In the meantime, I cannot wait. I have to get something in place of these Patriots. So Turkey asked from China earlier for a similar thing. Right. He couldn't get it because they didn't want to give the technology. You know, this is all negotiations. So Russia said, hey, I need Turkey. I can work with Turkey. Why? Because I'm weak. China is growing fast. India is fast. America is still the big. I am not what you, I used to be. So I can work with Turkey. So that's why they made it. They gave the technology transfer. They sold it for a good price. It's a free market. So Turkey bought it. Now immediately, US senators, unfortunately, 
they don't have enough information out there, you know, they go with what is available. Okay. Of course, based on that information, they said, we cannot give you the F-35s because you bought this S-400s. So that's a whole bunch of other things that you should know about that, the argument's sake, we don't have to go into it. So what happened is that Turkey bought S-400. What does it say? It says that America lost jobs, high-paying jobs to Russians. That's how I translate it. If you don't sell Patriots, each piece costs three, three billion dollars, or about that, and Russia is producing and selling this, they are making that money. Good. Now, because you, they bought S-400s, now you don't want to sell to Turkey 100 of these 135 million dollar planes, aircrafts. Right. So that's a 20 billion dollars. So you are not selling to Turkey. So that's another American jobs lost. Now, Turkey made a deal already with Russia to buy Su-57, the fifth generation new plane. They have only 10 prototypes. So they're going to go into mass production. They're going to transfer technology to Turkey. Turkey doesn't take anything anymore from anybody unless they, he can sell to third countries. Double whammy lost American jobs. How? One, he's going to buy more Su-57. You didn't sell F-35s, so you lost 20 billion. But now they are going to co-produce that and Turkey is going to sell it to some other countries that U.S. cannot sell anymore. Why? Because when Turkey is part of the F-35 project, each plane comes to about $10 million cheaper than otherwise because Turkey is part of the consortium of nine countries and sure. he comes with the 400, it comes with the 400 ex exclusive technologies that indigenous technologies. So Turkey is going to, not only F-35 went to $10, billion, $10 million per plane higher cost, but also now Turkey is going to pr produce the SU-57, five, ten million dollar or three million dollar cheaper than what Russia can produce and faster than Russia can produce. What's it? This is the market. He's going to sell a cheaper, better plane because he has the indigenous technologies that he's not giving it, it's not giving it to US anymore or F-35 anymore. So more American jobs to be lost. So I know in the game changer, I say, hey, it's a game changer if you don't read it and apply it. Why? Because if you don't read it, then you're going to lose $20 billion job, uh, American jobs here. Then you're going to lose more jobs in international markets. It's a game changer for America. Reverse. So, okay, this is, so there's this, you know, economic impact that you're describing. Um, what about, you know, I think a lot of people have argued that the U.S.-Turkey relationship has, you know, maybe overseed over the last 10 years has been on the, you know, on the decline. Um, and, uh, and Turkey has gotten closer to Russia, you know, looking into, to, towards China and perhaps other, uh, other uh, nations. Um, what is the impact in your mind of that type of arrangement? Well, who ruled U.S past 24 years until 2016. Three presidents. Who are they? They are globalists. They opened arms to go to, to the globe. This, they said, Let, come, come to America, be part of us. We don't have to have a border. Let's live together, whatever they said. Look, the coup d'etat, a nation building process, was most between 1950 to 1980, when, during the Cold War. When Cold War finished, the Soviet Union disintegrated in 1991. Coup d'etat suddenly finished. There okay, was 250 coup d'etats during that 30-year span for many countries. But then suddenly coup d'etats went to whatever, let's say 10% to 20 Interesting. I, I looked at it. That's, I saw the statistics. I said, oh, it makes sense. It explains. So if there is 250 then, then it fell to 25. Coup d'etats or nation buildings, you know, they are together. You, you make a coup d'etat to build a new nation. So what did these, these three regimes, U.S. regimes, continue to support or in the thinking? 
they continued what was, continu uh, what was there, uh, modus operandi, during the uh, 30 years of cold, cold War. They continued that for the next 24 years, okay. until 2016. So the world has changed, right? In 2010, China, everybody noticed that China is out of hand. Is it's going to become a biggest, bigger, and biggest economy in the world? You know, that's when they realized it. But they did not realize in 2007 that Turkey is also becoming fully independent of the Western alliance. What these three administrations did not do, they did not prepare U.S one after the other. So they pursued certain policies. Don't forget, Angela Merkel came to power in 2005. He's a globalist. You know, he's like Clinton, like Bush, 43, and like Obama. He's, she's globalist, and she's the leader of the European Union. So she pursued those policies. Mm -hmm. When uh, Obama came to power in 2008, hey, another globalist, and in Europe too, Let's continue with this policy. What are these? These are the nation-building policies. So Turkey says, forget everything else. The world has changed. There is no uh, Soviet Union anymore. Turkey used to be the bulwark in NATO on the southern flank against Russia, Soviet Union. Yes, so it's not there. Now everything is changing. The world is moving along. And what is this nation-building concepts? So this is where they fell apart. So, so tell me, so what is the value of Turkey today to the U.S. after this bulwark is no longer this yes. an issue? Yes, now there is what, irrespective of Turkey, what these three presidents do in that 24 years is important to visit. They destroyed Middle East, right? They, they went to Iraq, they came out. Now, Syria, uh, who was President Trump was not there in Syria. It started with uh, President Obama. So, and before that, Lebanon was gone, Iraq is gone, and now Syria is gone. So the point is, they messed up the whole area. So some would say, hey, divide and conquer. That's British thinking of the 19th century. And you're applying this at the end of the 20th century? It's a little bit outdated. Everybody woke up. So now you don't have that. So you have a messy Middle East that you don't know how to control. You are not welcomed. The West, I mean. So when you look at the history, what happens is that if West, if the West, Western Europe, under the leadership of US, if West loses Middle East, what goes next? When you say loses, what do you mean? That means you, can, you don't have influence anymore. Okay. You are not in Understood. Iraq, you are not in Syria, you are not in Iran. You lost Iran in uh, and because when you made the first coup d'etat, uh, that, that's the repercussions in 79. I mean, I blame who made this 53 coup d'etat? Whose idea was that? It was a good idea, you know. With, but what happened is that you lost Middle East. You are only in Saudi Arabia. You are jeopardizing Israel. Let's not think about that, how much you are hurting Israel. You know, this is, you are supposed to protect Israel. You are making more problems for Israel. You are making a nuclear Iran. But the next one goes is Africa. Africa is gone. I mean, the theory or historical footprints are already in play. Middle East is long gone by the time Obama midterm was there. It was already gone. And now Africa is gone. Today, Turkey is in Africa in all the countries. Turkish airline is the biggest airline, flies to every single airport. What is the other country is China. Now, if you don't have Turkey today on board, on the Western Alliance, next to, next to US, forget about Europe. You have to have it next to US. If you don't have it, you don't have Middle East, you don't have Africa because then Africa, China, and Turkey are in Africa. If, you, if there is no US, Turkey is going to work with whoever else is there. Okay. So does it help you? Uh, does it answer your question? Say, what is the role of Turkey? Apparently, the role of Turkey is a lot bigger now than was then. That's the game changer again.
Here is a Turkey and Erdogan. They are game changers. Turkey as a geostrategic location, country, history, religion, whatever it is, all that values on it. Good, bad, ugly. But then Erdogan, he is a leader. He has been there 18 years. Okay, every leader when they come in first, they are a little bit harsh. You know, not so much leader. They become leader when they sit there. I saw eight of them. Okay. You know, the time makes them mature. Wisdom comes to them as well. They are human beings too. So what happened, I say in the book, Game Changer. Here's another Game Changer from the perspective that because lots of my friends who are veterans in the U.S., you know, because I get along with them, I understand, they understand the same, they have read the same books. And then they say, what if Erdogan turns Turkey into Ottoman Empire or something like that, some fanatic something? Okay. Well, I said, yes, that thing was there when 2002 started with all the obstacles in front of him. He had to establish himself, secure himself, make a name for himself, achieve something. Every, there is a risk there. He had to go full force. But what happened is that when 2007 came, from 2002 to 2007, that was a milestone. Oh, nothing was happening. You know, he was making progress. So then 2010 came, there is 8, 10, uh, when the Arab Spring came, it's another milestone. 2016, there was a coup d'etat attempt against him. Right. Well, who did this coup d'etat? The same globalist elements. It wasn't pr Trump administration who, you know, had anything to do because it was the globalists were still trying to build something and they went after him. But they're Interesting. See, there's, there's a number of uh, uh, interna international organizations or even, say, Freedom House in the U.S. who are very concerned about, you know, the loss of freedoms in Turkey, for example. Uh, recently, in the last last two three years, since especially since the coup, well, uh, attempted coup, yeah. Well, uh, you see, I was born to on the left side of the aisle in Turkey, because my family was like that. What is left side? The one who created the republic uh, of Turkey, Atatürk and his party, mm -hmm. and then Erdogan, Islamists came to power in 1980. Now, when they came in, I, as a person who, d who didn't know any Islamist until then, everybody was social. Uh, this was a socio-political revolution, Turkey. Okay. So everybody was social, political, revolutionary in a sense. But when these Islamists came to power, we said, who are these people? They are talking about religion. So we started to learn about them. And it took them, by the time Erdogan came to power, which is 2002, he's the third one of these Islamists. And then there was more suspicion about him. But 10 years later, what he built in Turkey, we are talking about modernity. Turkey today, second to China, on its way becoming biggest high-speed railroad network. China is going to have 30,000. Turkey is going to have close to 10,000. Turkey today has, used to have two world's top 10 bridges in the world. Mm -hmm. Now there's five of them. He built three of them. Two tunnels like this. So the mo I'm just giving you some examples sure. of what he did. He modernized. That's the He reason. modernized mm -hmm. it. Now Turkey today can modernize Syria. Why not? Because railroad ends there, he can build it all the way to Israel. Turkey today modernized Iraq, it can build it all the way to Baghdad. U.S. cannot build that. Western Europe cannot build that. Not even China can build that. Turkey can build that because it has a presence. Half of these populations there, somehow they lived in the Ottoman Empire. Plus, Turkey has a military there. They can move in if there's a problem. And by the time U.S. moves in or some other ones, no, it's difficult to invade Middle East. Speaking of, you know, Israel, obviously the number one U.S. ally in the region, um, you're 
from what I'm hearing from what you're saying, you're looking to uh, you know, propose that Turkey should definitely become a greater U.S. ally. Um, how does that fit vis-a-vis -vis Israel? Uh, today Israel can be ten times much more richer than what it is. And today it's spending all this money to defend itself against right. all those people. Today, if, if Turkey built 10,000 building 10,000 kilometer long rail network, bridges and everything else, forget about that. What is from Turkish border to Tel Aviv? You can be in Turkey in one hour with a high speed train and from there in Europe, whatever time takes, 10 hours. So this is the best way to connect through the land bridge to prosperity, to security. You know, the, the question was, I say that Erdogan changed. Well, it changed. Everybody changes in 20 years, 18 years in power. He's a much more, he has much more statues in his name with bridges, tunnels, and everything. So he doesn't need to invade anything if he had any notions of that grandeur in his life. Today, he has everything. He has so much. He's as big as Ataturk is today. Okay. And so that, in other words, Erdogan can give more to U.S., to Western civilization, to Middle East, and, well, you see the example with Russia. He's giving lots of to Russia. That's why President Trump came in. The first day he saw what the problem this F-35 is, then he said, what is this Patriot S-400 dilemma that I am inside? How come you're not selling things to these people? Here's a hundred billion dollar sale, and I'm telling you, Turkey's building three nuclear plants. Each one's $22 billion. Russia is getting $22 billion from there. And SU-57 we talked about. Right. The other ones we talked about. Right. And this is only just the beginning. So in other words, economically, it is a lot more than few jobs here and there. Turkey, American jobs are being lost in great numbers by not uh, joining forces with Turkey. That's why I say game changer is to bring two countries together to bring because of these two leaders. You know, they are meeting of the minds. They are so different. One of them is Muslim, Islamist. The other one is on the side of the evangelist, you know, at home. And one of them likes American football, the other one Turkish football, and neither knows what the other one is, you know, likes. But, uh, but they are, they are on, on the same boat on the free trade, free and fair trade. That's all they need to do, free and fair trade. Once they do that, America prospers, Turkey prospers. Once they both are in the same page, Russia is on the same page. European Union is on the same page. Middle East is okay and will not deteriorate further. And Africa will not go to China altogether. So suddenly, what happened? How come one country, one leader could be a game changer for America? Yes, apparently it could. And it is. Today, 30% of the European energy comes from Russia, Iran, Az Azerbaijan and Iraq. And where do they go through those pipelines? Through Turkey. Um, there's a couple of Senate bills that come to mind that, for example, the one that uh, encourages an alliance between Israel, Egypt, Cyprus, and Greece, I believe, Correct. Uh, related to the pipeline, so, you know, excluding Turkey. Um, uh, there, there's another bill uh, similarly that are basically don't seem to be a a acting uh, on, on Turkey's behalf. How can the president work with Turkey in this kind of a context? Well, I don't want to put words to anybody's mouth, but I believe President Trump uh, supports the idea of working with Turkey than any other concoctions that I call concoctions because they are not practical. When Greece, Israel, Cyprus, and Egypt come together. They need to build a pipeline from the Leviathan, from the Israeli oil hydrocarbon right. reserves to all the way to Italy eventually. That cost 
And a good estimate, they say, the best estimate will be there in six years. But it will cost $7 billion. It has to go 3,000 feet or meter down below the surface of the water. Now, there is a technology there. This is the best estimate. But they say good estimate is it, won't, it will take more than 10 years. And then when 10 years, price goes up. So it may never happen, take place when a project that long. So in the meantime, the same way of getting those hydrocarbons out takes two years over Turkey. And it's probably half cheap because of the half of the pipelines are there. So for President Trump, who is a business, who makes it bigger, better, and faster everything, right? He's not talking about just construction. On everything, he's like that. He talks fast. He thinks big. He, he makes everything faster. He's like that. So he says, hey, there's a, there's a path to make it two years. In the meantime, you're telling me there's a path five, six, 10, 15 years. And the shortest fast is cheaper. And you're telling me seven billion, and that's to start. So this is a simple argument to win. Suddenly, you undermine Russia, who controls 30% oil shipment through Turkey. Russia and Turkey can agree to hold Western Europe hostage. What is the alternative? But this pipeline through Turkey suddenly takes Russia out of the picture. And how do you control Turkey? Well, Turkey is benefiting from all these pipelines. He has to make a deal. Turkey doesn't have any leverage when you bring more trade to Turkey because it has, it has more to lose. You don't even have to sell gun to Turkey or confront it militarily. This is a simple logic. That's what I explain in the Game Changer. I'm not writing about one problem or two problems. I'm writing probably 50 different problems because all the problems are resolved the same way. This is like a way of handling everything. It will make the game different for China too. China today is waiting for 2020 elections, right? And they, can, they have all the time in the world. But if Russia, if Erdogan and Trump today have five more meetings in the next one year, five more meetings like Putin and Erdogan is having five or six meetings per year now. Okay. What happens, do you think, in China? They come to the table. Whatever you ask, religious freedom, this, that, China is going to make a deal with you, with America. Why not? Because they don't want to lose Turkey. Belt and Road Initiative passes from Turkey. There's six of them, the most uh, useful one because of the climate goes from Turkey. That's why they built the third bridge over the Bosphorus. That's why they are building the high-speed trains of 8,000. Most of the technology is coming from China. The, what part of it does the, do the United States senators don't understand this equation? So we're going to finish up shortly, but I, have to, I, have, I think it's really important you understand you're, you're presenting a, a number of different you know, positive scenarios here for, you know, closer a relationship between Turkey and America. What is the risk to America of that? There is no risk because Turkey westernized itself. But by a lot of, by a lot of credible measures, um, Turkey has become less free in the recent, in the recent years. You know, pre press freedom has been reduced. But the question is still, is this, is this a society that we can see eye to eye with? What transpired since President Trump was elected in the US, what happened to media? as a member of press, you know, press officer. What I witnessed, how the division of American media became. And what did that do to America? It killed the freedom of press. Today, overseas, in Turkey, when they look at it, they say, which one is correct? Are the Republicans saying the right thing or Democrats are saying it because media is reflecting that. So before, there was a fourth estate for the U.S. foreign policy objectives to be put in action. 
there was military and all the other stuff, economic things, but the fourth estate was the media. Right. So since 1870, media made the revolution in Ottoman Empire and ruled all those countries that became new nation states. Now, who should they believe over there, coming from America? When President Trump speaks, Security Advisor Bolton spoke. He said, what is he talking about? He, the president said this, he's talking about that. It was a confusion. Now, media is the same thing. In other words, the message that's coming from America is not clear over there. So over there, the people on the right or the left, the ones who, whatever, however you want to put this into perspective, media that is with Erdogan versus against Erdogan, they say, hey, we are right. We are telling the truth, like in America. The other side doesn't want to listen to us. Please listen to us. And they are working. The other side, no, they are saying wrong. So the split is over there, was there. Now it's inflamed uh, because of our doing as Americans. Interesting. And people don't pay attention to these things. Before, we sold everything to them. They, uh, they took the chewing gums, Hollywood movies, everything that was America became theirs. Today, they say, no, we don't need what America is giving to us. We have our version, including the, your opinion, they say, about the freedom of press. What is that thing? Explain to me. Show me an example that there is one. When you guys are bickering over there, like in the 1970s, Europe was bickering. That's why we had all the terrorism over there and the chaos here. That's why, that's how I end, end the book in one sense. I say, I came here in the 1970s because there was chaos over there in the middle, in, the, in Europe, in Turkey, coup d'etats and everything else. I, I came here, I said, I find the peace. I find civiliz civilized world. But that civility is not there anymore. So I say, if there is no civility here either now, where do I go? There is no other place to go. So that's why I wrote this book. I say, hey, this is going to be a game changer for me and for you and for everybody because we have to protect the last bastion of the Western civilization in the US by rebuilding what we started to destroy and we started to destroy since 1991 with all the globalist element. How can Americans be sure that uh, um, Turkey will be a stable, positive ally to the U.S. in the future? So long as there is free and fair trade with Turkey, like Trump and Erdogan began to build by increasing the trade 10 times, and could be more, and then Turkey, U.S. will have a leverage that it never had over Turkey, and this will be the only guarantee that Turkey will not be a headache like Iran or North Korea is. Otherwise, that's the least of it. Turkey will be a nuclear power and independent of the West, and there is no return from that. So free and fair trade and having President Trump who can do it, that's the only way out. There is no alternative. It's a one-way street. Erbil Ganasti, wonderful to speak with you. Thank you very much.